time for me to hand over to my dear co-presenter and the panel of the day. Geraldine, you speak about from local to no, from global to glocal. Maybe you have to explain the title first. Glocal, I'm such a little dummerchen. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to say it's lovely to see you again today, Tarek, and what a wonderful job you've been doing so far, and how, how exciting it's been to listen to the speakers. And yeah, I'm excited about the panel that's going to follow now as well. So I would say as a short definition, you know, this idea, the classic um, sort of tagline to think global, but to act local. So to make sure that we know what's going on in our own environments, but also have a view for the bigger picture of what's going on elsewhere in the world. And I think that's so important, especially today, um, especially as we're seeing about maybe how to localize more things in production, but still not playing things out with people, for instance, living and working from making textiles and garments in developing countries. So those are some of the ideas that we want to be discussing in the panel coming up now before I hand it back over to you for a wrap up. Okay, nice. I'm already team Glocal. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Tarek. So yeah, big welcome to our viewers and our participants from my side as well. Um, the panel, as Tarek already said, is titled Reevaluating Fashion Economies from Global to the Global Home. And I just want to give you a few sentences what I think we're going to be talking about in the next half hour before I introduce our panelists to you. So the current pandemic has, of course, resulted in shutdowns, and those have created unprecedented challenges for many industries, including the fashion industry, including decline in consumer spending and a disruption in supply chains. But these challenges could in some way also be seen as opportunities with consumers' values shifting toward more sustainable consumption and a lot of new policy measures taking place on the European level this year. So we want to take a look to see how can the pandemic maybe also accelerate a greener, more sustainable fashion industry, more sustainable supply chains, and take a look at those different policies that are going to come into effect and see how they are having an impact on today's fashion economy. So that's the topic of the panel. We look forward to debating that not just with our panelists, but also with all of you. Please keep your questions coming in through the chat. Please use our hashtag 202030 and join our debate. I have three very exciting people here that I would like to introduce to you now to, to shape this discussion. First off, I would like to welcome Jade Budenberg to the debate. She leads the sustainability topics for Solando Recommerce, who just got a big shout out in Una Buddha's presentation. Rightly so, as some really exciting things are happening at Solando at the moment. And Jade is working on that. She's working on scaling the pre-owned offer really pushing Solando's circularity goal of extending the life of more than 50 million items by 2023. So before joining Solando in 2016 to help build all its sustainability efforts, Jade was a researcher and consultant in several sectors and countries, including UN Women at the Collective Leadership Institute, uh, working in Cape Town and Potsdam, the city of Hamburg, so very <laughs> local to local is also part of Jade's biography, you could say. Um, and she's also... Um, part of the forum advisory board, innovation forum advisory board, sorry, of the global fashion agenda. So a true um, expert and pioneer in this field. Welcome, Jade. Thank you so much. <laughs> Next up, I'm very excited to share the stage again. Um, we've sat on a panel at Neonit, which I remember very fondly, with the fabulous Osla de Castro. She is an internationally recognized opinion leader in the sustainable fashion world. She started her career as a designer, where she pioneered the upcycling label from somewhere, which she launched in 97 and led till 2014. Her design collaborations took her to many different companies and different places, including Tesco, Speedo, but also the four best-selling capsule collections for Topshop from 2012 to 14. In 2013, together with Carrie Summers, she founded Fashion Revolution, a global campaign with participation in over 100 countries around the 
the world. And she's really been a pioneer pushing this idea of global responsibility and local responsibility in the fashion industry at the same time. And exciting news is just that she's also an author now, published a book very recently called Loved Clothes Last, How the Joy of Rewearing and Repairing Your Clothes Can Be a Revolutionary Act. Welcome, Ursula. Thank you. And I'm also very excited to welcome Dr. Ulf Jekke, who is an economist with a PhD in environmental economics. He's been with the German Federal Ministry of the Environment, Nature Conservation and Nuclear Safety since 1994. At present at the Federal Ministry, he heads the division Sustainable Consumption, Environmental Product Policy, and he is also the co-lead of the United Nations Program on Consumer Information for Sustainability and represents Germany in various national and international bodies. Welcome, Ulf. Thank you very much. So, um, I already mentioned in my opening lines that there are a lot of exciting policy changes taking place and a lot of new sort of policy efforts coming out on the European level and I really want to discuss some of those with you to stay and I'd like to start with this new effort of Europe called the European Green Deal under which a lot of different initiatives are collected including zero net emissions of greenhouse gases by 2050, curbing pollution, um, but also the idea that um, producing new goods really need to utilize a circular economy model. So I would like to kick off this debate by hearing from each of you what kind of hopes and expectations you have toward the European Green Deal in, in moving, really giving a real dynamic and push toward a more greener and sustainable fashion industry. Ulf, um, let's start with it from a policy perspective. I know these are some of the topics you've been working on your, for the bulk of your career. So how do you see this opportunity at the moment? Yeah, thank you very much. I, I really think that the Green Deal and the circular economy uh, uh, framework is, uh, is, a, is a chance to to do more on uh, the textile field. It, it can't be ignored anymore. There are two, the, the environmental and social impacts are, are much too, too big as uh, uh, that uh, the, the policy can, can let it run as it did uh, the, the years uh, before, the, or the decades before. Um, I uh, yesterday spoke to the commission also about the new strategy on, um, on textiles, which will be out at the end of the year. And um, they will uh, follow a holistic approach, and that's what we are favoring. There is a battery ordinance as a first example. We are now discussing on the European level uh, from cradle to grave, so to say, uh, covering all the, uh, uh, the the phases of the life cycle, and that's, that uh, should also take place in the textile sector. Um, there will be discussions beforehand, uh, before the end of the year, before this strategy comes out. But uh, of course, Germany will play a role there and we will uh, um, go for an ambitious approach uh, from design to uh, the, uh, the production process to the uh, handling of uh, post-consumer uh, um, uh, textiles and uh, uh, the uh, circular uh, circular aspect. So there are a, a lot of instruments and a lot of phases to uh, to be addressed, and uh, we we are um, we are negotiating negotiating for that, or we are aiming at uh, that with our in our negotiations in Brussels. Thank you all for that first sort of assessment. Osla, I would like to bring you in next and understand if you share this sort of positive outlook. Is this one of these key pieces of regulation that we've been waiting for or how do you see the situation? Well, first of all, I hope not to have a very visible nervous breakdown right now because obviously I'm in London and so it'll be Brexit for us, you know, for the near future, at least for the central team. But of course we need um, legislation. I mean, at Fashion Revolution, we've been publishing a fashion transparency index, you know, which we considered very much the first step. But 100% visibility ought to be mandatory and, um, you know, accessible to customers as well as citizens on behalf of brands because we need to scrutinize an industry that has been supporting growth over perspective, uh, sorry, over um, uh, prosperity. 
and an industry who has been, uh, you know, exploiting nature and people for the best part of, you know, the last, you know, since industrialization, really. So um, we need government to intervene. We need solid legislation because the onus cannot be just on citizens to, you know, provide that change and, as they say, pay with their wallet. You know, we need to be able to trust the brands that we choose to buy and it is the brand's responsibility to be able to offer us a product that doesn't harm either the people who make it nor the environment that we all share. We are seeing positive legislation in France. There is a stronger due diligence law, um, you know, the, the right to repair, which I think I think it's incredibly important, as everyone knows, you cannot repair your clothes. I would like to go way further. I would like to see repairing lines precisely in those super cheap shops that give us clothes that break. So I really need to see the onus on this being on, on the brands, you know, for the forthcoming future. At Fashion Revolution, we very much believe in the, um, uh, you know, an industry that conserves and restores the environment and values people and, and planet over profit and growth. And we do need to do that all together, and in particular with the help of legislations and regulations. Absolutely, which is um, rightfully echoing the sentiment of our keynote speaker today as well. I want to stay with you for a minute, uh, Osla, because you just mentioned another piece of legislation I was going to bring into the debate, which is um, the due diligence law connected to the new um, supply chain regulation uh, legislation that the European Union brought forth last year. And because I have um, been following, of course, the campaigns that you ran over the last years, especially bringing attention to the situation, you know, the who made my clothes idea like really bringing the world together which is very much the core topic of our panel not just to see these things isolated and to make our lives in Europe here cleaner and better but to see this as a global endeavor so I was thinking about you when this um, piece of legislation came out to see if this is again like a key step in a more globally responsible world what are your hopes how that's going to take effect well, you see, the global thing that you mentioned makes a lot of sense to me. I'm Italian and I was brought up in many ways um, in, in pockets of a fashion industry that worked, that was dignified, um, that was efficient. And yet, in my 20 years as a you know, designer and, and then curator and then campaigner, I've seen the opposite. I've seen us, uh, you know, exporting, as well as all of the knowledge and the know-how, um, we did not export the dignity of that work. So we shoved all of those responsibility onto others precisely because we had designed an industry to be deliberately opaque. And in this opacity, all sorts of human rights and um, environmental abuse can take place. And you see, there is, for me, there is no difference between the rights of nature and the rights both need to be at the same level when it comes to evolving. I mean, we are called fashion revolution, and sometimes I feel like the revolutionary, but sometimes I look at the word in a different way. The letter R next to the word evolution. We cannot continue to evolve under these circumstances, and COVID has acted like some kind of giant magnifying lens. It's been so obvious. Brands increasing in profits while owing, owning, owing garment workers billions in unpaid wages. This is all bubbled up to the service. surface. We can see this happening. And so this is why we need um, not just this mandatory visibility so that customers can scrutinize their brands, but the support of global government in order to ensure that it's not just on our shores that we can be accountable, but spread this accountability wherever we've spread this industry. Absolutely. Um, Jade, Salando has not been given a shout out only by Ina Buddha, but also um, I was reading a paper from UNIDO, so United Nations Organization on Industrial Trade, in preparation of our panel, and Salando got a very 
big shout out there as well, because it was named as one company that is bringing evidence to the fact that COVID has had a positive impact in the sense of creating a market for more sustainable fashion and sustainable fashion consumption. Um, so it was cited the, that you, Solander, reported more customers opting for sustainable fashion, with almost 30% of your um uh, increase in that in that segment since March 2020, which is of course quite significant. So, um, yeah, looking at sort of the different actors and the different pieces of the puzzle, of course, a shift in consumer values and mindset is is very desirable to go hand in hand with these policy changes. Um, so it's really something that's happening in the interest of consumers and everybody working toward the same goal. How is your view of these new policy measures that we've discussed now? And how do you see Solando as contributing to that? Yes, so uh, thanks for the shout outs. Of course, we try to really push the agenda and we see the problems of sustainability and the challenges we face, not just as a fashion industry, but as a whole people, so big that we need all the actors in the field um, to push this on the, to the agenda, correct? So it's governments, it's businesses, it's the individuals, it's NGOs, we need everybody. Um, and this is the view we take that uh, it needs to be a holistic um, effort. So the European Union, I think, is quite a good start already, um, because these uh, challenges, of course, systemic, right, and quite complex, our supply chains are complex. And so we need to kind of um, um, take that bigger picture view into consideration. I am also hopeful because, um, as Ursula said, uh, this crisis has been a magnifying glass on many of these issues. And so it's becoming really um, an awareness raising year uh, this year to also put those um, insights now into action, right? So this is where we kind of really encourage and um, like to see these initiatives on the policy agenda, but also just uh, when we speak to our customers to know that they you know, care about what's happening and they want to do better, they want to do more. And we're here to try to innovate and work with partners um, like Circular Fashion, but also other brands and the industry to give customers really um, more options to, to um, do something for the sustainability agenda. So pre-owned launching that category last year was really a huge step for us into that direction um, because we know, of course, it's a way to um, have new outfits without uh, the resource intensity behind. So this is something we want to push further. Um, and yes, I think uh, many other initiatives. So um, the feedback we got also from, from pre-owned customers is really that um, the COVID crisis has led them to think about how they consume, um, to make more conscious choices, um, and also to uh, want to extend this trend into the future. So um, we're hopeful that it's not something that will go away with uh, the pandemic, but something that will, will systemically change the industry. I want to just ask one follow-up question toward that. Um, I'm, I'm assuming there's a hope that if brands and companies see their product having a new lease of life beyond that first sale and the whole idea about secondhand really changing a lot um, over the past year. I think there's so many great examples of different startups coming up, what you're doing, um, feeding into that. Do you think that's going to cause, and here's what I'm assuming the hope is, more quality production because brands realize their product should last on beyond that first owner? Yes, so I think this is the hope. I just uh, read a survey by Euromonitor where um, the uh, customers were also replying that, you know, they discover uh, better quality items through a lower price point with pre-owned. And that means they um, then also switch a bit of their habits and it's kind of an upselling effect also because of durability and quality of the item. So this is really speaking to your question that uh, there is a bit of a shift happening. Of course, we need to make sure to sustain that and, um, uh, yeah, make sure to to listen to the different trends to cater to this. But um, it's making me quite quite optimistic. I'm very happy to hear that. <laughs> um, or if I would like to, I would like to learn from you. Um, where where do you see sort of further measures and tools? Because this is, of course, are going to be a, you know a longer implementation plan. Osla mentioned a number of other policy tools that could come into effect and um, support this dynamic, including, for instance, uh, further measures down the road to the right of repair 
I'm wondering if there are other tools that you're also thinking about, like, for instance, are tax exemptions thinkable for such reused or repurposed products? Um, yeah, is that something that your ministry is currently working on? Um, yeah, I think, yes, we want to um, to, to uh, raise the, uh, the level playing field to, to have the companies doing something and uh, uh, working on sustainability get rewarded for, for that, which is uh, so far not, not really the case. Uh, um, yes, there are other instruments uh, um, like, uh, for example, sustainable public procurement. We got a, a, a target of uh, procuring 50% of uh, sustainable clothing, uh, sustainable textiles in, in our federal government. Uh, we will not uh, meet that target uh, in, in 2020, but uh, we have now, um, uh, yeah, uh, um, have guidelines uh, developed to, uh, to, to get there, a, a sort of a roadmap. Um, that is uh, that is one thing. The due diligence law we are working on is uh, is, is another issue. Also, the um, the assessment of uh, of labels and standards, uh, which we are doing from the government side, is is something. So not uh, not every claim, every label is uh, regarded as a uh, uh, as uh, as one. Um, uh, um, uh, with uh, with some ambition, so and and we um, and and we are communicating that uh, also to the consumers. But uh, one thing uh, which is also very important to us is uh, um, to give incentives to business models which uh, counter fast fashion. How can mm -hmm. we do that? How can uh, uh, business survive? With uh, just selling uh, um, fifty percent of the uh, of the textiles or thirty percent of the textiles they are selling now, how how can that work? That, will there be uh, repair? Uh, uh, will there be renting uh, options? What whatever? How we are figuring out how how that can uh, how we can incentivize that and. Um, uh, this will also be uh, fed into the process on the European level, of course, because we are, uh, in a way, um, bound for some measures uh, to the European level uh, uh, and uh, not fully free when, when it comes to measures on the national level. I would love to pass that question on to both Osla and Jay to see, you know, what are the sort of creative measures that you're addressing brands with and companies with saying you don't have to produce yet another collection, pump out all this waste. Um, but here in other ways that you might think about monetizing your work, Osla, is that something that you're, um, yeah, what do you have any, any solutions on offer? Well, I do a few several. <laughs> uh, so first of all, I would say that I'm not really uh, a fan of talking about fast fashion because fast luxury um, is hardly, um, you know, free from, from the guilt uh, just, you know, uh, itself. So, again, radical accountability. When we have a luxury company saying, I will be diminishing the amount of shows I make, I will be making those moves, it means nothing to me if the numbers that they're actually producing are published and you can tell me exactly how much that show reduction means in terms of pieces reduction. So, you know, these are, this is what I'm expecting from the main. Mainstream. This is what I'm expecting from luxury and this is what I'm expecting from, uh, you know, the high street. But most of all, I'm expecting a shift in power. That's the only solution that we can really genuinely um, embrace if we want to make um, changes starting from now. And the reality is that, you know, a handful of brands, I don't know, 20, 30, however many, or control about 95% of, of the market. And yet all of the best and the most creative solutions are not in their hands because it's very difficult to stir a huge ship that's just designed to be making profits. It's so much easier to replicate 10,000 little ones and put them right next to them. So I want to see the young designers that we feature at Fashion Open Studio. I want to see the young designers that our individual global country coordinators are scouting and finding and supporting and promoting. I want them 
to be available and as visible as everybody else, both online and physically. This is alternative because at the end of the day, all of these brands are telling us, oh, but, you know, we're giving you choice. Well, frankly, um, you know, millions and millions of pieces of identical pieces and runs, that's not choice. That's an imposition. It's an imposition on our capacity to make choice and find the um, alternative. It's an imposition on our planet and it's an imposition on the people who make those clothes. So to really find solutions, we need to redress this balance. This industry is just as inefficient as it is exploitative. So those would be my solutions to really give visibility to everything that we've got that is um, alternative. And the other one is, as I said before, responsibility. The cheaper the clothes you sell me, the more the onus to mend them is on you. I want mending stations in every supermarket. I want mending stations online. Great respect, Zalando, that you will be selling secondhand clothes, but where's your repair system when your clothes break down? When can we teach 16 and 17 year old that what they buy is precious because it's theirs? And when it breaks, it doesn't mean that you buy another one. The whole joy of it is repairing it. And so really repairing clothes and repairing systems. I'll pass that straight over to you, Jade. Yes, um, uh, I have to say personally, I don't take so much joy in repairing, but uh, there's definitely ways to offer people the yeah. choice to get that done, right? So this is something um, we're definitely looking into at least uh, providing information on how that can be done and also working with partners to inspire um, users to, to look into that and, and also learn more. I think curiosity is also something uh, that will play on our side for this. So um, uh, the question about, uh, you know, what are the solutions here? Um, I can give two examples where I see a lot of innovation happening that can have really a systemic effect. Um, so, you know, Zalando is a platform, we work with over 2000 uh, brand partners, and we really see that we have the responsibility and role there to collaborate to really push the agenda um, uh, further. So one example of this was the Small Steps Big Impact campaign, where uh, I really enjoyed the designers of different brands come together and share best practices of how to design um, items with circular principles, right, to make them last longer, to use materials that may be already recycled, etc. And, and that knowledge building, I think, had a had a really profound effect, um, uh, which will reach far beyond this this collection. So this is something that um, I would definitely always encourage to think about design first. Um, and the other thing is, of course, the tools that brands uh, need um, in order to understand their own supply chains um, and and create transparency for for consumers, for themselves, for the workers. Um, and there we um, are an early partner of the Fashion for Good Accelerator. Um, with, has a lot of um, promising innovations come through, may it be technologies around blockchain or tracing DNA. So there's um, yeah, a, a lot of good examples there um, that, that will definitely shape our future in, into yeah, um, a promising one. I want to start bringing in some questions that are coming in through the chat from the people who are um, who are listening to us, and and I want to also bring in the idea that maybe it's not just about creating different ways to monetize, like new monetary streams, uh, new revenue streams, but also a way it's to share resources and save costs. And one question that came in was, how can we encourage less secrecy and monopoly, more knowledge sharing and exchange in the industry? People are seeing that in the tech industry, but not so much in the fashion industry. Now, one. An interesting exa example I read about was that um, some companies, and I read an example from H&M, are beginning to s share their supply chain infrastructure. So rather than everybody have their own delivery system to um, create a a business to business initiative called Treedla that allows other players to access H&M global supply chains. Do you think the open sourcing of such technologies, of such um, yeah, of such tools can also be a way to encourage more collaboration and how can we push for such openness? I'd like to pass that on to Ulf, not knowing how much you can say on that topic though. Um, if you look at other sectors, you, you see uh, this is uh, quite a difficult thing. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, there are um, 
collaborations, cooperations, when you think uh, of packaging, for example, they had to cooperate because uh, they, were, they were forced to uh, in uh, setting up a system for uh, recycling and uh, collecting of, uh, of packaging waste. Uh, and uh, I think here, uh, at least in the post-consumer uh, uh, area, this uh, would make a lot of sense and uh, uh, having their extended producer responsibility in the area of, of design and in the area of, of, of sourcing of, uh, uh, of material, the, the experience uh, shows that it's uh, rather difficult. So it'll be interesting to see how those small industry initiatives maybe develop also and how can they be encouraged in the future. I want us to stay on the H&M example for one quick question that I also want to ask you, Ulf, because we have a lot of quirks, of course, in, in all countries, but also in Germany when it comes to sort of prioritizing some policies over others. And I heard that some companies, again, example H&M, that have tried to sort of bring, be more circular and collect their old garments when they're worn. Um, I'm sure that, you know, from a consumer perspective, a lot of people realize, oh, look, there's a box now. I can throw my old H&M clothes in there when I go shopping at H&M. So that actually caused some um, conflict with local uh, garbage facilities saying it is their job to collect such items and not H&Ms. How can we get rid of sort of such quirks that are maybe hindering innovation in the sector? Yeah, I think the situation at the moment is that the, there are uh, too many uh, uh, used clothes on on the market, and uh, there are enough for these uh, uh, charity organizations and also for for others. The, the problem of reusing the material is the, uh, the the mix of fibers we we have there. So uh, if we uh, could incentivize um, industry to uh, have uh, so to say one fiber closing, uh, which is uh, uh, easier to uh, recycle that uh, that would also help and also would it help uh, if we could uh, set some um, recycled content targets uh, so that there is an, uh, a real incentive uh, or, or a need to uh, uh, to to recycle uh, I don't know what H&M is, is doing with the closes and uh, I, I know from some of the charity organizations uh, that uh, they got so many clothing that they are not uh, taking pay, taking them anymore because uh, they are their 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 warehouses are full with that or well, stock is too full. And we're going to squeeze in one last question to you as well, because we we often live with conflicting policy interests, and we're seeing that right now during the pandemic as well. Um, we're talking about an FFP2 mask directive now in Germany, and the keynote speaker today made another plea for make your own mask, make your own mask, put an FFP2 filter in it. I myself belong to the category of people who bought reusable masks with FFP2 filters, and of course now... It's so understandable that the pandemic would override any of such um, ideas around not being wasteful with materials. But can we not, even under the circumstances we are in right now, make sure that s sustainability and environmental priorities are always built in, even when it comes to dealing with COVID as a priority? I, I think we are um, in, in, a, in a different position now than before the, the pandemic. Uh, people are more aware of these uh, things and also policy is, is more aware. And uh, I think the acceptance of uh, some more hard measures, so to say, is, uh, uh, has, uh, has grown. Uh, and it's, it's hard to say how, how it, will it look like after, after the pandemic, but I, I don't think that we will get to the status uh, which we had before. So there, something will be left and then uh, I think um, sustainability will be one of the winners and not, not the losers of, uh, of the, this, this, this area, er, <coughs> this, uh, this time now. I think we At all share I that hope. hope. That. <laughs> A shared hope. Let me squeeze in two more questions that came in from the participants. Um, uh, maybe over to Ursula again. Um, a question came in saying, we we're experiencing this huge craft revival during the lockdown, and it seems like every Generation Z person is busy on TikTok watching craft tips. Do you think this is like, you know, always this idea like the next generation is going to fix it? Is that though? So, 
something that, you know, without wanting to push all the responsibility onto the next generation, you see is a different like shift in mindset um, happening right now? Yes, I do see a shift in mindset, but I also believe that the information is here and it's available. So it's a shame that this generation hasn't decided to take up on it and, and do more and, and putting the, the kind of, you know, the onus on, on our children whom we should be protecting and defending rather than, you know, shoving into the front line. I tell you what is exciting me, though, about this generation and in particular what happened this year. And this is Black Lives Matter. Because um, for the first time, I am the mother of four children and the grandmother of two. So I, I talk with, with uh, you know, I know them and all of their friends. And what I've seen is this huge shift whereby the new generation is looking at us parents, at their teachers at school, at their government, their peers and their museums even, and saying, you've taught me wrong. You've not showed me the truth. And I will inform myself and learn Therefore, I could do better. That's a fundamental shift because, you know, particularly when we talk about fashion, we talk about slow fashion, but we still buy fast. Even if we're buying a sustainable brand, we're still just buying fast. The point is that what COVID, I think, will leave us with, and this is this interest in craft, is understanding that your time can be used differently in relation to fashion. So whether it is learning a new skill, whether it is learning about the culture that originally created that skill and wanting to protect that culture and that community as well. But the thought of buying with a different set of principles in mind or creating with a different set of principles in mind. So if you're buying, don't just buy for size, buy also how to fit your principle. Looking for the perfect color, don't just look at the shade, look at the ingredients with which it was made. So this understanding from future generations that in order to make those shifts, we need to first become informed and find new places where to reach that information. To me, this is exciting. It's opening the door to a more political generation. Lots of shared hope in this panel. I want to um, pass one last question that came in through the chat over to you, Jade, which was about greenwashing in the industry um, and really sort of sorting out those companies actually leading the way and some just putting a label on it. How do you go about that um, with the, yeah, with the customers, I'm sorry, with the clients that you work with and the different brands that you work as well, avoiding greenwashing effects? Yeah. No, I, I share um, Ursula's excitement about information and also the thirst for understanding the challenges better so that then uh, me, myself, uh, or everybody, all the customers can make better choices. So um, I know many are concerned about greenwashing. The one thing I would always first like to stress is that um, every step into the right direction is a good step, right? And of course, the standards we use to judge uh, should be high. But um, yeah, I think uh, um, often we also just need to kind of acknowledge that uh, there's no, you know, one size fits all solution that will be the silver bullet. Um, and I know when talking to customers, they also understand that. Um, and they know that, you know, especially for big companies, uh, taking a big step means also um, having a big impact. So this is, uh, I think, a collaborative uh, journey together, and they understand that. Um, and uh, the um, standard that we, I mean, of course, it's always hard to judge uh, if you don't have a common standard in the industry, right? Which is why we're working with the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, for example, on the HIG Index, which is, you know, supposed to be a, a cohesive way to collect data and then to also make that data comparable. And we're trying to work with brands um, and also our innovation department to see how we can then make that data available to customers more and inform everybody on, on you know, what you care about for water consumption, for example, or other issues that might be dear to people's hearts. And and um, we'll keep on doing this. Um, but unfortunately, right now, we don't have this uh, standard completely figured out. So we'll take it step by step and, um, yeah, continue on this journey. 
I'd like to thank you all so much. I would like to say, you know, there is, there's lots to do, but there is reason for hope. All these policy measures coming into play from supply chain to circular economy. And it's also very exciting to have a panel with um, the activist side, the industry side, and the policy side. So it's united in I think the direction we need to take. So thank you all very much for your time today. I have to squeeze in saying us that I love your wallpaper. It's so beautiful. So thank you for giving that wonderful background to look at during this panel. And a big thanks to our audience as well and the people who actively contributed with questions and comments. And back over to you, Tarek. Sorry, sorry we took a little bit longer than expected.